seated. Our scripture reading uh, this morning comes from the book of Philippians. We continue in our series, Joy Even Though. And we read here at, as Paul ends, uh, begins the conclusion of his friendship letter, letter of friendship to the church at Philippi. We read these words, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them and the God of peace will be with you. In our scripture passage today, we heard the words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. These words move us toward the conclusion of the letter. And as is typical of Paul's letters, he begins his conclusion with a series of brief exhortations. He writes, I urge, I ask, rejoice, let your gentleness be known. Do not worry, let your requests be made known to God. Think about these things and keep on doing. At first, these exhortations may seem unrelated, but they're actually very interrelated with one another, with verse 4 standing at the center. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. In his commentary on Philippians, Gordon Fee writes, he says, joy, unmitigated, untrammeled, I had to look up the definition of that. It means unrestrained. Unrestrained joy is, or at least should be, the distinctive mark of the believer in Christ. He writes, Christian joy does not come and go with one's circumstances. Rather, it is predicated to get altogether on one's relationship with the Lord and is thus an abiding, deeply spiritual quality of life. It finds expression in rejoicing, which is an imperative, not an option. And with its concentration in the Lord, rejoicing is always to mark individual and corporate life in Philippi. Now, before we dismiss this imperative from Paul as someone who didn't understand the sad or difficult trials and tribulations we all walk through in life, we want to remember that Paul wrote these words while he himself was in prison, awaiting for a decision on his fate, most likely that which was going to be a death sentence. And we remember that he wrote these words to the church at Philippi, these believers who were just setting out on their faith journey with Jesus who were setting out on that faith journey in the midst of a Roman Empire where they were going to face danger and inevitably persecution. And so Paul is no Pollyanna a theologian. Paul is grounded in reality. And in that reality, he writes that they and we are to rejoice in the Lord. It is something we do. It is to give verbal praise and honor to God. It is an action. It is an action. But as psychiatrists and psychologists and neuroscientists will tell us, our actions are interrelated with our thoughts. As Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, sow a thought and you reap an action. 
our thoughts and our feelings can interfere with living out the imperative to rejoice. And in our passage, we will encounter three difficulties that can keep us from rejoicing. Three problems that can keep us from having joy in our thoughts, having joy in our mindset. And those problems that are mentioned are conflict with others, anxiety and worry about our lives, and the focus of our attention. Thankfully, the scriptures provide guidance on how to overcome these problems, providing practical solutions to these problems so that we can experience joy in our thoughts. Now, conflict is the first problem that can get in the way of experiencing joy in our thoughts. The story is told about little Jonathan. He came home from the playground with a bloody nose, black eye, and torn clothing. It was obvious that he had been in a bad fight and lost. His father was patching him up and he asked Jonathan what happened. And he said, well, dad, said Jonathan, you know, Eddie, that boy that's always giving me a hard time. I challenged him to a duel and I gave him his choice of weapons. His father said, well, that seems fair. Jonathan replied, I know, but I never thought he'd choose his big sister. Conflict is a part of life, whether we're little Jonathan or we're his father or his grandfather. People get into arguments, right? Controversy erupts. Relationships are broken. Resentments can build. Conflict happens, even in church. Even in the church at Philippi, they experienced conflict. They experienced it because it, they're human. They were human. But what's important is how we deal with conflict. And so we hear these words from the Apostle Paul. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. Now, Paul mentions these two women. He, you can tell that he has affection for them because he mentions them by name. Whenever he doesn't mention someone by name, that's when he doesn't have affection for them. But he mentions them by name. Euodia, whose name, whose name actually means success, and Syntyche, whose name means lucky in Greek. So success and lucky are having conflict. Now they have been leaders in the Philippian church, but apparently they're not seeing eye to eye about something as they struggle alongside Paul in the work of the gospel. They haven't had much success or luck with each other. Now the challenge with conflict, especially if it's not dealt with, is that it can simmer in the background. And usually what will happen is people will rehearse whatever the disagreement is over and over in their minds. And so instead of thinking about what is honorable and just and pure, people will think about what? What is dishonorable or unjust or impure? They focus on what is displeasing, and they will brood over it. And as they brood, anger will build, and eventually resentment sets in. And once that happens, people dig their heels in, and the conflict becomes difficult to solve. Not because the conflict is unsolvable, but because the parties to the conflict are not looking to solve it. Their position, whatever that may be, is more important than anything. And so Paul is concerned about this conflict in the church at Philippi because it's detrimental to their witness. And so he urges Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind. He wants them to have unity. He's saying to think the same in the Lord. Have the same mind. This phrase is the identical phrase that Paul used earlier in Philippians chapter 2. To be of the same mind, he said, having the same love, being in full accord. And he goes on to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. As I shared with the children, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And then he says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at that passage, and there we learned that Christ's attitude or Christ's mind was what? To be of service to others. And Paul is saying to these women, if they each move towards having the mind of Christ, they will be able to resolve their conflict and experience joy. Now, further instruction is given in verse 5. 
He says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Gentleness. Gentleness. I think that's a, a quality or a virtue that maybe is uh, underestimated in our culture, the idea of gentleness. The Greek term is epicaeus, and it's difficult to translate into English, and there's many different translations for it. Wycliffe translated it as patience. Tyndale said softness. The Geneva, the Geneva Bible has it as a patient mind. The Revised Version says forbearance. But when it's used in Greek literature, they themselves explain that this word is justice and something better than justice. They said epiakia ought to come in, it ought to come into play when strict justice became unjust because of its generality. So the idea here is people have this quality when they realize not to apply the strict letter of the law. When they know to relax justice and introduce mercy. And so the term means much more than gentleness. It denotes generosity towards others. And it's a characteristic of Jesus Christ himself. Think about the story of the Gospel of John. When the religious leaders bring, bring the woman who had been caught in adultery to Jesus. Jesus demonstrated this quality when he went beyond the letter of the law and he went beyond justice to mercy. William Barclay writes, as far as justice goes, there's not one of us who deserves anything other than the condemnation of God. But God goes far beyond justice. For when we were still in opposition to God, Christ died for us. And so to have the same mind as Christ means to be people who know that there's something beyond justice, to know the generosity of God and to be generous with one another, especially when we find ourselves in conflict because such generosity can lead to resolving that conflict and experiencing joy in our thoughts. So conflict can be the first problem. And the second problem is worry and anxiety about our lives. Worry and anxiety about our lives. Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, present your requests. Let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. There was a doctor that did a study about worry, and he found that only 8% of what we worry about is legitimate. That means 92% of the stuff we may focus on could be imagined or never happens or is completely out of our reach to impact. And so what happens when we worry, it's been said, is that we waste today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. And so if we have a propensity to worry, it can prevent us from experiencing joy in our thoughts. But again, Paul offers a solution. First, he reminds us that the Lord is near. Now, commentators are divided if this means the Lord is near in time or in space. But I think what Paul is saying here is along the lines of Psalm 34, 18, where the psalmist says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Or Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, all who call on the Lord in truth. And so Paul is saying to the Philippians, remember the Lord's nearness. And then he says, instead of worrying, instead of worrying, he says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So he says to pray. About what? Everything. Everything. From the time our eyes open in the morning till they close at night. And then he says to pray in supplication, which means make requests to God about your concerns. I've known sometimes people will, will pray to God and uh, instead of presenting requests, 
they make demands of God. There's a difference. We're instructed to pray by making requests, realizing what? That God is God and we are not God. That God's plans may be different from our own. And then thirdly, we're instructed to pray in thanksgiving. That we make requests of God in a spirit of gratitude. That requests are accompanied by thanksgiving. And when our thoughts are torn, turned toward thanksgiving, it's hard to have a mind that's focused on worry. So we can give thanks to God for God's character, God's presence, God's creation. We can give thanks for the privilege of prayer itself. And the result of such prayer is what? Is that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace will stand like a sentry on guard over your heart. That's a military metaphor. And of course, the Philippians would have had at the forefront of their minds the peace of the Roman Empire. But that peace came through coercive violence. But the peace that God offers happens not by tyranny and terror, but by the loving transformation of a willing subject. Peace comes in and through and by Christ to us in prayer. And so we've seen that conflict with others, anxiety and worry about our lives can prevent having joy in our thoughts. And the third thing is, is the focus of our attention. William Barclay writes, the human mind will always set itself on something. He says, if we think of something often enough, we will come to the stage when we cannot stop thinking about it. Our thoughts will be quite literally in a groove out of which we cannot jolt them. Now, Barclay was a pastor. He was a biblical commentator. But if you talk to a neuroscientist, they will tell you that he's actually correct when it comes to our actual study of our brains. Right? That neural pathways are laid down. And once those pathways become traveled over and over and over and over again, it becomes difficult to change those pathways. And so it's important to set our minds on the right things. This past week, I read a reflection about how that can be hard in our modern society due to these. Not that we're setting our mind on anything, probably. Sometimes this is not letting our, ourselves set our minds on anything, right? It's inattention due to being distracted by our phones. But the important thing, Paul says, is to set our mind on the right things. And so he takes a list and he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, pleasing, commendable, anything that's excellent, anything that's worthy of praise, think about these things. This is a virtue list from the Greeks. Paul borrows it and incorporates it into his letter. And his point seems to be that as followers of Jesus, we can take into account the best of the world in which we live, even though that itself may not be overtly Christian. We can celebrate truth and beauty where we find it. We can recognize the origins of all this, that it finds its origins in God, and we can give thanks and we can give praise for those things in our lives. That article that I read recommended if we wanted to uh, have greater attention to put our phones down, to leave them behind, and to get out into creation, into God's creation. And to find the things there that are what? That are excellent and praiseworthy. And to think about those things. A very practical step we could take to have joy in our thoughts. Finally, the Apostle Paul concludes with these words. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them. He invites the Philippians to, as he says elsewhere, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. The invitation is to be like Christ, to put into practice these things so that we experience God's peace and we experience joy in our lives, joy in our thoughts, even though life may be throwing us difficulties, challenges, tribulations. Paul says, do these things and God's peace will be with you. Let us pray.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word and the guidance it offers to us. As we think about this imperative to rejoice in you always, help us to take the steps in our lives to experience joy in you. Help us to let go of conflicts. Help us to let go of our worries, to place our trust in you, and to think about all those wonderful blessings that originate with you, for you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Amen. Our response to him this morning is number 400.